And what I need is a couple days off just to rest Practice this meditation, get the stress off my chest That's what everyone suggests, cause I walk around depressed I confess these court cases keep me under duress And these doctors give me tests and prescribe me narcotics They think what I need is another Xanax bottle I got chest inflammation and my muscles keep twitching Then my hands go numb and I look up every symptom Which just adds to the problems, I need wisdom, I need knowledge I need to acknowledge that I may need to see a psychologist Need to tell myself that my father's really dead I need to stop listening to these voices in my head I really need to talk, I grab the phone and call a shrink She tells me she's available to meet me next week I tell her all about my issues, I'm in pain Can you help me? I feel drained, feel enslaved I Micah Jackson here with Derek Bros. You are just hearing Fetty Profound from his album Thought Criminal. You can find more music from him at www.fettyprofound.com. Well, it's another week of Freethinker Radio. Glad y'all are here. Going to talk to y'all about all kinds of stuff. We're going to get started with a couple of little local events I'd like to tell y'all about. Um, if you don't know about the Houston Ghost Bike, that's those white bikes that you see around town in Houston. Maybe other cities, too. I imagine this is uh, a uh, national campaign, if not you know it should be um but come up uh, next saturday saturday the 5th they're going to have at flying squid art gallery that's 1507 durham they're going to have a um opportunity for people to come and uh paint the next round of 30 bikes that they're going to strip paint and uh get out on on the uh roads around town to remind people and that's going on early in the morning saturday so you early risers 9 a.m to 1 p.m if you want to go help them sand down some bikes take take a moment to care about some of our fallen cyclists out there um in this uh in houston we know there have been quite a few popular people that have gone that way in the last uh couple of years so here's something you can do uh doesn't cost anything just go and uh work yeah yeah you can find that on facebook it'll be on the freethinker radio page which if you haven't liked please do um so you can keep up with all things freethinker radio Another event in, you know, a ton of, we, we touch on events that are close and uh, dear to our hearts with the Houston Free Thinkers as well as just um, activism events, but we also like to talk about other things that just, you know, we're human beings, we're interested in things, and they uh, catch our attention, such as that ghost bike um, rally uh, painting prep thing. Um, there's another thing coming up, uh, it's not till October 5th, but uh, it's called the uh, Wearable Tech Fashion Show. It doesn't give us a lot of information about it, but it's endorsed by Houston Fashion Week, and I guess um, it'll be, you know, like Google Glasses, different type of wearable technology, and um, I think it'd be an interesting thing for people that are concerned or interested in um, working in that field or concerned about dangers of that field, you know, to go and know what's going on in that world because, you know, the, those things are going to happen. So it's interesting to, to be able to see them uh, working technology with fashion, see, see how they're doing that, shaping art and culture and vice versa. What do you think about that, that Derek? Um, I saw that event. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree the importance of, you know, art and culture and music. And I think that's probably why we do a lot of what we do whether it's from activism to you know working with visionary noise and putting on uh, events music all around the city and of course our big festival for the community which you know just early shout out to those of you who don't know we'll be putting on our 10th that's right number 10 for the community festival completely free November 21st and 22nd here in Houston Texas so I know we got people who listen from all over the world what's up Mike in Australia um, and if you can make it to Houston there's a really great community out here, all types of people, all types of music, backgrounds and interests, really just cross-pollinating and crossing over each other. And For the Community is definitely a good avenue for that. So, yeah, we absolutely believe in the uh, the importance of the community and the culture and, and shaping really a, a you know revolutionary message, trying to get people to look outside of just the mainstream, which often I think leaves you feeling like you're alone. It leaves you just feeling like the world's just consumerism or it's just got you arguing over whatever the latest you know drama is that they want you to talk about definitely uh you're right it's uh being involved in shaping and also being involved in seeing it form because it's definitely uh more than just that which it's channeled from on high to be um it is uh, an amazing event people have come from italy japan we've had activists uh come from uh, around the country uh um, you want to mention a couple of the uh, speakers that we've had? Yeah, like at last uh, time we had, I can't remember who we had locally, but in the past we've had um, Nick Burnaby from the Anti Media. We had uh, John Vibes, who's a journalist from uh, Maryland, and also, of course, we've worked with 
Oscar Yetzira of Houston Stand Down. He works with a number of different homeless veterans groups. We've also worked with Randa Fox of um, Not On Our Watch, the America Foundation that is trying to put an end to uh, the abuse, sexual abuse of children. And, uh, you know, Food Not Bombs, tons of other people that we've worked with in the past. And this, this for the community coming this November is going to be no different than that. So absolutely, I encourage each of you who are listening, regardless of where you're at, if you want to take a vacation, come take a weekend off, spin it in Houston, check out, I mean, we're going to, this is going to be ridiculous. Let me just tell you briefly and then we'll move on to the news. Like we're going to have at the minimum 80 different artists of all types of music, performers, you know, every variety you can think of. There's going to be uh, a really good poetry section, all kinds of poets from around the city. And I think we're bringing some people from outside as well. Um, there's going to be local vendors. You've got a huge marketplace of foods, crafts, um, candles, soaps, all kinds of things you can think of. And some of them will accept alternative currencies. Yeah, there's going to be some, you know, we'll be having some that take silver, work on Bitcoin as well. And uh, in addition to that, there's going to be an illusionist. There's going to be, we might have a little freak show. There's going to be, um, as we mentioned, the speakers and just all kinds of ideas and the whole thing is free so really check it out look on facebook for the you community currency you don't need alternative currency you just need to be there november 21st 22nd if you're on facebook as derek was saying just look ftcx you'll find the event i think about six acts are confirmed in there you'll see the event unfold and just build with speakers and vendors and even if you're not in houston you can discover some great music discover some great art maybe find some people you can work with i think we already have about eight vendors in there and it's growing yeah, absolutely. It's going to keep growing. So we just want to show love to everybody who's helped us uh, be able to do that. And we're actually brainstorming on maybe being able to do an episode of this, a live episode of uh, Freethinker Radio broadcast while we're out there, at least record a podcast you know, while we're there on the scene. But lots of things happen in the city. Before we move on to the news, though, I want to tell you about a couple other events um, that you know, Micah just mentioned, two things, the ghost bike thing and that, uh, that technology thing there. Also, uh, he mentioned liking Freethinker Radio. If you'd also have some time, please like the Houston Freethinkers on Facebook. There's a page and there's a group, but give that page a like and you'll see all the events we post. And generally, everything will get you know carried over between Freethinker Radio and Houston Freethinkers. But if you like both of those, you'll for sure see all of our latest episodes. I think what we're going to do is switch to doing strictly YouTube videos. So, you know, you don't, there's nothing, if you want to watch the video, we might work in doing the articles on screen. But if you just want to throw that video on and listen while you're doing whatever at your house, you'll get to hear from us. But uh, SoundCloud apparently has a, a time limit and wants us to pay some money. So we're transitioning as we move back. Of course, this is the second episode of Freethinker Radio of our, our return. And there's lots of things to cover. I want to tell you about we it. We on the YouTube channel for the Houston Freethinkers until we find more permanent homes and probably continue to post episodes there, um, our archives, uh, which, you know, we have a close affiliation with that group. So you'll be able to discover other videos there. So maybe take a moment to go ahead and subscribe to that channel. Um, if you share this video, um, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Subscribe to all the channels. We're on all that stuff. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, everything. You'll find Freethinker Radio and all the information you want there. We did two events this weekend that were really great. There was a Saturday night. There was a documentary screening that we hosted at a restaurant that we use sometimes, the Midtown Bar and Grill. And it was called the Luna. It's about uh, the Koji people, I think is how you said it. And it was uh, really interesting. They're down in Colombia, Sierra Nevada mountains. And it was this guy. Uh, he's a, a British guy, a documentary a make, a filmmaker. And I think he was also probably an anthropologist. But he'd known them for 20 plus years. And he had been documenting his interactions. And, um, you know, they come to know these people. And they're, of course, being forced into smaller and smaller areas. They are an indigenous population. And even... The more modern, I guess you could say, Colombians have kind of battled against the indigenous people. This is sort of seems to be the tale around the world. And so it, it follows their story where basically the Koji believe they were saying, you know, that they were in tune with the, the earth and that, you know, the people of the earth have disconnected from nature and that they were told by, um, you know, their, their gods or their spirit, however you want to think about their creator, to basically send out a message to get people to be active in the world and to pay attention to the damage that's taking place and their own individual actions. So it was really cool because it showed them go from the mountains in Colombia and then take a trip all the way to London to go speak to some international conference and kind of follow their journeys on that. So it was interesting. Definitely, I, I recommend it. And I think you can uh, find that online. And I believe that the proceeds 
for paying for that go towards uh, the foundation that's based on supporting the Koji people. So that's called Aluna, A-L-U-N-A. Check that one out. That was Saturday night. Thank you guys, to everyone who came out for that one. It was a good time. And then just yesterday, Sunday, we had a Skillshare, a how to use Bitcoin Skillshare. And for those who might not know, we've done Skillshare since the very beginning of the Houston Freethinkers. This is definitely something that was integral to our inception is just trying to share ideas you know, hands on how to things as much as philosophy and rope, you know, not tying and all kinds of different things. Spanish. I mean, we've done tons of different classes, um, how to can your own vegetables, how to make bread, uh, herbal, you know, remedies and just a host of things and anything out there that you think, Oh, parkour. Yeah. I mean, see, it's just a physical things as much as how to, as much as knowledge. So really if there's anything out there you think that you can share and what we've found is that we all have different pieces of knowledge and may assume, Oh, everybody knows that. Right. But, it's not always the case, and we can often kind of help each other just get stronger, get more empowered but through our knowledge. So we like to share that. And yesterday's class was on how to use cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, and it was really cool. Uh, if you don't know much about Bitcoin, I can recommend a site that a friend of mine recently built just called BitcoinHowTo.org. Some real simple videos and explanations on how cryptocurrency works and how to get set up and walk you through the whole process. And we sort of followed their models as well as it was me and another guy named JJ who we've had at past Freethinker meetings who uh, runs a company called Yo Soy Bitcoin or I Am Bitcoin. And his goal is basically to translate Bitcoin material into Spanish and other languages and get it out to the international community. So we got to have a good conversation with him. And we had you know several people who said, we asked the beginning, how many of you have what is your where's your knowledge on bitcoin basically there's one person who never heard anything about it didn't know anything and the majority about half was uh people who heard the word bitcoin read a couple articles or whatever but never used it didn't have a wallet or anything like that and um it was really interesting a lot of questions a lot of conversation a lot of insight from you know jj and from just the things people are curious about and concerned about but by the end of it all we were able to set up eight people with new bitcoin wallets which is really awesome you know i, I think that's a good step and i feel like you know we i was telling them hey this if you if you we definitely encourage entrepreneurship and if you sell your own paintings or make your own candles or crafts or whatever or make music whatever your product is there your craft that you have to to sell and to put out there you now have another currency you can accept you know so that opens you up to just a new wow. audience yeah. yeah so it was a cool feeling and good stuff you know and that was uh that was yesterday um sunday and fast forward just a couple of days ahead thursday night if you're in houston thursday night 7 p.m 7 30 uh, midtown bar grill will have our monthly meeting for september where we sort of set the agenda for the next month and see what things people want to work on and friday we've got uh we have a lot of ground to cover um but uh the meetings are really interesting um and most of the action i think it occurs like after the meeting and then as the relationships develop but uh, you might wonder what happens at an HFT meeting, you know. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people have heard of the group and seen us in the media and seen us all over the web and stuff. But, you know, basically you come in and different people lead it. Uh, I shouldn't even say lead, but facilitate the uh, meeting, you know, because we try to follow a loose agenda. And that's just go around. Everybody introduces themselves and says what they care about. Um, and then from there, we say what we did last month and we say what we have coming up on the calendar what looks interesting and we see what people are interested in and what they uh what type of events they know about and uh we try to uh, find things to do to reach people and uh, advance the message of freedom for the most part would you say that's a good summary of what happens yeah exactly i mean that's pretty much exactly what happens at the meetings and and i agree with micah that the bulk of you know there's the houston freethinkers facebook group which has 5300 people in it that half aren't at least aren't from houston aren't even from, maybe from texas and some of them probably aren't even real people and you know there's some discussion and we post events and stuff like that but it's a we're a real world community you know and like micah said as well we have different people facilitate uh the meetings and we're really trying to just show people that that those who are involved and have been involved in uh hft and just the different groups and ideas that it connects to and parts of the community understand that it's a it's a really it's a self-motivated thing that people come in and if you've got an idea a goal then we all collectively can use our networks and help each other where we can but really it's you're expected to sort of be self-motivated and you know put push your idea forward and people will assist you in that and the well, meetings are so things hatching out of there you know at different times and then we have other groups coming to it the super is a very interesting group i'm sorry for uh, uh interrupting there but uh you're you were talking about so much coming from it and i think that's one it's kind of like a crossroads of activism and culture as well just the hft meeting because i've seen people from 
from diverse political parties approach the meeting. Um, I think in a way, everybody has a point of freedom they care about. And so I think that's what attracts them to HFT. I like to say we work to serve freedom as a unified whole. And that's how I think it brings people together. Um, um, I, I, I don't know. You know, there have been I was thinking of some of the different things that have come to the meetings, you know, such things as last organic art outpost, uh, um, the super people, um, the polit- different political parties, people just doing things, people who create their own Bitcoin sites, people who make movies, normal people that just like to go to shows, musicians, and on and on. I'd say we average, what, 20 to 40 per meeting, sometimes about seven people who go to street actions or hold skill shares and are there. Um, but uh, there's always new people. There's always new people. So if it's something you've been thinking about coming out to, but you thought it'd be a whole group of people you didn't know, that's a good thing. Um, Because it's often a whole group of people we don't know. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a good place to to meet and network with people. And again, I I agree with Mike as far as our uh, our diversity. That's I, I just can't stress enough how, you know, what the group might the idea of the community might appear to be on Facebook sometimes is not representative in a very uh, in any important way really of what the you know the makeup of it, it happens the page is more of yeah like what's going on we'll post news and the page the Facebook page has our events and stuff but the group is so many people in there there's all kinds of different discussions and uh, like I said a lot of those people we've never even seen so if you want to know the, the, the people who are helping things move forward in the city or just connect to other groups generally if you can't if you're interested in something that we can't that we're not working on we can connect you to somebody who is and that's a, that's a beautiful thing it's a, just a networking community really activist networking community let's go ahead and move into the local news the first thing I want to touch on is um, this this deal with this statue here this is local to Texas and I think this is kind of a, a bigger conversation that we've been seeing happen around the country the past couple months we, I think we touched on division a little bit earlier and just how divided things can be and uh, you saw the flag you know definitely people have an issue with um, the history of the Confederacy whether they're very well versed in it or not just generally the idea that it represents slavery I think is more what people are upset about um, and just that they see anything connected to the confederacy or quote-unquote southern culture is a representation of slavery and i can you know understand it in some sense because i think there are definitely some things you could say about uh native american american indian culture that where you look at different histories and things about the united states where you're like okay well from their perspective that's not a very beautiful thing to celebrate and so i get that but um you know the whole tearing down the flags all the government i get yeah government buildings shouldn't have things like that but if it's like like we were talking earlier if somebody's saying like somebody has to take down a flag on their own private property and we start like wiping away history like that i saw somebody make a comment like oh this reminds me of the end of the soviet union like history and things just being wiped out and um you know a lot of history is horrible but we should try to remember it work towards understanding it but this is basically about the university of texas ut is removing jefferson davis statue uh from the campus as well as uh woodrow wilson was that it moving to woodrow wilson statue as well and uh, the president of the university, Greg Finvis, said the statue would be moved to a museum. So some people would say that's a more appropriate place for it. But, you know, what do you think about this particular case, but also bigger, like, you know, the whole tear down the flags, like, you know, take away symbols of hate, change history type of thing to, because it's so disturbing. I mean, what do you think of those arguments? Huh, the arguments. Oh, goodness. It's... it's- that's a uh, that's an interesting thing. I tend to agree that we shouldn't. A lot of uh, problems with racism and have come not just from culture itself, but also from instituted racism. Racism basically instituted by the state itself, um, where it you know you mentioned the uh, some of the um, n- um, what do you call it the indigenous people and the the way various tribes were treated. Um, you know that's a that's a example of instituted racism the um the uh what do you call it the mandatory white black water fountains etc um uh that was instituted racism uh the, like basically state buildings had all of that um so i think that's a real problem and we definitely don't want and i don't think that there's room for the state to a state for free people uh to spend money you know maintaining or um 
doing anything uh, to prop up something that's just divisive. But humans are humans, and you know where do you draw the line? Because I'm sure there's not going to be a single person listening to this broadcast and beyond that hasn't done something that was out of their interest, out of like not not meaning to fulfill, but in opposition to their own personal interest. So when you get that way, what? I mean, what, are we going to not have any statues? Uh, history does get rewritten, and uh, that's kind of something that we all need to remember is that history is an ongoing story, um, and it's often written um, by those who can write uh, or those who can broadcast. Uh, so it doesn't have to be just the rich, you know. Uh, a lot of people can do things. But nonetheless, yeah, we don't need to have the state advancing it. The arguments that these things represent Slavery is the real problem with the philosophic problem of representation, period. Uh, like, that's why the, you have the whole side that says, no, it just represents my culture. Because, like, it's really hard to say what something is representing to you. You know, these are, um, that's why you can't say it doesn't represent slavery to other people. So, you know, I can understand why something that's all of ours, like a university, might be, I don't know, you'd have to go and check all that out i know they get a lot of state funding etc it is a state university etc um so uh something that's supposed to be all of ours doesn't have any room for division but when it stops teaching anything about slavery or when it takes out i think that these problems like when they don't have the stories of tom sawyer and huck finn anymore because they say the word nigger jim i think that that's kind of a problem because we're losing what was wrong with this like we're losing a taste of what the culture really was you see what i mean and i feel like maybe we don't need those in high school but we obviously need to still have these stories like i mean i'm pretty sure that uh that there's relevance to that and that it, the story itself doesn't really preach the division any more than the flag being there preaches the division but what it does is it reminds people and it empowers people who wish to use that symbol for that because they basically just had the state advance this symbol that represents many things just like a song you hear it and you draw one meaning out of it the writer might have meant two different meanings at best it probably has millions of different meanings the world is full of meaning and so like uh the the, the example that the idea that we could even rewrite history i think there might even be some sort of objective history that's beyond us being able to write about and that's just simply what happened um so you know what what happened we took the statues down and moved them to a museum that's cool you know uh what's wrong with that uh, I guess if you get to where you just want to destroy the statues, then you're kind of like an iconoclast, you know, and I can understand the uh, the argument for it, but I th I'm not sure that it's uh, relevant to these statues, you know, because they're definitely not the people in power. The people in power, I don't think they care about any race. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Put me on the next story. That's right. Well, thank you all for listening to Free Thinker Radio. Uh, I'm going to get into a little bit of, uh, oh, we're, this is something that's kind of interesting. And, um, you know, there's so much so much uh, violence in uh, our culture um, and in the world today um, that we just don't need any more. And it's really sad when we have a, what, state instituted or supported violence. And there's been so much uh, examples of police brutality across the board. Um, and we got another example, August 19th, uh, individual, uh, I shouldn't say another example because it's not so much police brutality as much as a problem with the massive police state. And I'm not going to say that this person didn't do the things he's charged with because he never made it to court. Yeah. He basically died in jail. So we don't know, you know, he could have done these violent acts to people, which he did violate someone's property. Um, but basically, this guy, um, J. Michael Mitchell, uh, um, is a black man. He was an inmate at the Hampton Roads Regional Jail. Um, he was found dead in his cell August 19th. He was 24 years old. He had mental illness, according to the court documents and the family's attorney. So the court knew this. The medical examiner's report has not been released yet, and therefore the cause of death has not been confirmed. It's obvious that he did not receive the help that he needed, said the... <coughs> Uh, cr cr the uh, lawyer uh, for the family um, and that's the main issue that he didn't receive the help that he needed uh, so that could bring in a whole other set of worms but nonetheless court documents show that Mitchell was arrested April 22nd 
yeah, speedy trial, right? Uh, for stealing a Mountain Dew, a Snickers bar, and a zebra cake from a 7 Eleven on George Washington Highway in Portsmouth, Virginia. Mitchell's mother and family members met with uh, the attorneys for the first time, and the uh, attorneys said that the uh, mother is having trouble coming to, de coming to grips with her son's death. Uh, and the uh, circumstances around his death. Uh, a uh, psychological evaluation was done on Mitchell while he was in jail and said the uh, inmate admitted to having bipolar disorder. A judge later said Mitchell was incompetent to stand trial and must be transferred to the hospital in Williamsburg. A general district court d clerk explained to us there were no beds available at the hospital. So Crudy said the family still has many questions about what happened leading up to his death. So they feel that some of the answers could come from the records of the jail. The focus is going to be what exactly they knew and what they did and what they didn't do. Uh, Crudy said his, his impression Mitchell was not taking his medicine while in jail and therefore not eating. According to family, Mitchell had gone through dramatic weight loss. Crudy's explained what he believes jail employees are required to do with inmates who are ill, quote, either deal with the situation adequately at the jail or refer the person out to the appropriate place. In my mind, they would have been an emergency room if there were not adequate bed available. So basically, if he couldn't go to the hospital, you know, and the guy's getting skinnier and skinnier and looks like he's about to die, maybe you want to, like, let him go to the hospital or send him to the hospital or even let him go. Uh, Crudy said he will now be questioning all relevant records from the jail, which will include medical reports, hospital visits, and records by jail guards. What we can hope is that maybe there are some jail guards that actually bother to note it in there. You know, this is something everybody's got a role to play, you know, um, and this whole everybody like this binary division of people into this or that, you know, uh, us and the opposition is a real problem. So what what matters is that we're all human. So hopefully people who kept these records, you know, did a professional and good job and served, you know, humanity in that way. Um, but, yeah, it's another death in jail that probably could have been avoided. And for a Snickers and a candy bar, I tend to doubt that I bet eight or ten people that if you snow, stole a stick, Snickers and a candy bar, they probably wouldn't want to shoot you. What do you say? I think it sounds a little bit extreme. <laughs> To get shot for a candy bar? <laughs> okay, but he wasn't shot. But let's just say starved to death, you know? And how much did we pay to starve this guy to death? You know, we didn't. Virginia did. So, and how much are they going to pay now because of the neglect and, you know, incompetence? I don't know. It's just, these are, these are like side effects of this overbloated police state. Yeah, absolutely. And we definitely have an overbloated police state and a surveillance state. If it wasn't so big, I'm so sorry. If it wasn't so big, if he had really stolen from somebody, there would have been room for him. There would have been room for him in even a prison hospital. There would have been room for him. But because there's people in there with victimless crimes and stupid BS, there's no room for him. So things that are little crimes become death sentences. Or you get guys that are like out on horrible freaking crimes in just a couple of years. Absolutely. It's definitely, like you said, it's a product of the overcrowding and of the growing police state of being criminalized for regular, everyday, uh, otherwise innocent behavior, which is filling up and crowding the jails. And it's also, you know, goes the police state goes hand in hand with the surveillance state. And we had a recent court ruling, pretty important ruling here just this Friday. Uh, related to the NSA bulk data collection and metadata collection, which of course was revealed in 2013 by whistleblower Edward Snowden. On Friday, an appeals court overturned a U.S. district court decision last May that had declared that the NSA's bulk collection of Americans' phone records was beyond the authorization of the law. The three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for D.C. kicked the matter back to the lower court for additional deliberation. So this decision did not declare the NSA's program to have been legal or constitution, rather it focused on a technicality. A majority opinion that the plaintiffs in the case could not actually prove that the metadata program swept up their phone records. Therefore, the plaintiffs, the court declared, did not have standing to sue. So basically, because you can't prove that we did it, you know, you can't sue us to reveal whether we did it. Plant the plaintiffs claim to suffer injury from government collection of records from their telecommunications provider relating to their calls. But plaintiffs are subscribers of Verizon Wireless, not of Verizon Business Network Services, Inc., the sole provider that the government has acknowledged targeting for bulk collection, wrote Judge Stephen Williams. Today's ruling is merely a procedural decision 
said the ACLU's attorney, Alexander Abdo, who argued against the program at the court. He says, only one appeals court has weighed in on the merits of the program, and it ruled the government's collection of Americans' calls record was not only unlawful, but unprecedented and unwarranted. And despite Friday's decision, the bulk collection program will end later this year in accordance with the USA Freedom Act passed by Congress in June. But that is, of course, if you actually believe that they're going to put a stop to this and that they don't have a million other programs running. You know, I mean, this is a problem that kind of comes with the surveillance state. We may have even touched on this last week is the idea of I think we did. We were talking about technology and just the idea of how do you roll back and stop that once it's out of the box? You know, they've got billions of dollars invested into it. We can talk about the NSA, but then what about the CIA's program? What about the FBI's programs? What about I mean, I've there's so many different, uh, you know, bureaucracies of the government that have the ability legally and otherwise to monitor communications and it's just uh it it's really it's really insane so i don't know how like you know the celebration of if i'm sure later this year there'll be some mainstream media celebration that oh nsa spying is finally ended you know this is a victory of the people coming back and rallying for this usa freedom act which is also most people say the freedom act created less freedom and made it easier for them to spy just like the Pre- patriot act but this uh this is just the latest here in this particular case that you know this is just We'll see how it develops over the coming years, if anything actually will be done. I'm sure people will be fighting over NSA surveillance for probably the next 20 years with lawsuits. But this uh, next story here comes from the Associated Press uh, related to the Department of Justice. Now, what's interesting, and I can't quite figure this out, is this article was posted today, August 26th or not today, but a couple days ago, August 26th at 10 a.m. And then I'm seeing like a nearly identical article on other alternative media outlets and uh, the one I'm looking at is from RT back in June of this summer, and there's really nothing new that the AP says to this, so I'm not sure why. Maybe they just decided to that they uh, approved of it or thought that it was worth uh, discussing now, but it says DOD manual allows journalists to be held as belligerents. The, the new, de- new one was published June 21st. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I don't know why they the AP is just now picking it up because it was published then, and that's when everyone else first wrote about it. But it says new Defense Department guidelines allow commanders to punish journalists and treat them as unprivileged belligerents if they believe journalists are sympathizing or cooperating with the enemy. Who's the enemy? The Law of War manual, updated to apply for the first time to all branches of the military, so this is across the spectrum, contains a vaguely worded provision that military commanders could interpret broadly, experts in military law and journalism say. Commanders could ask journalists to leave military bases or detain journalists for any number of perceived offenses. In general, journalists are civilians, the 1100-page manual says, but it adds that, quote, journalists may be members of the armed forces, persons authorized to accompany the armed forces, or unprivileged belligerents. And according to the government, a person deemed unprivileged belligerent is not entitled to the rights afforded by the Geneva Convention so, Convention, so a commander could restrict from certain coverage areas or even hold indefinitely without charges any reporter considered an unprivileged belligerent. And this is similar to George W. Bush's uh, non-combatant, uh, enemy combatant. Um, just using, you know, their, their new speak language to rewrite you know, what what it means to be for truth and for freedom or just a journalist out there trying to spread information. Uh, And this article goes a little further into it discussing the program, but that's pretty much the tidbit right there is just that. And, you know, that sounds really, you know, just really just minute that that idea of the single line has changed but often i think that we can find the case of that especially with the law it's the way that they write these laws and the language the broad language and vague language that allows them to fit to ram a freaking train through you know and to get whatever they can out because it's so vague and so broad that they can define it 10 different ways and uh you know it applies all over the place so yeah that doesn't really bode well for my uh my job security (laughs) Well, that's the problem with Big War Machine, right? Because they are concerned that uh, the um, journalists could be terrorists or spies, you know? Think about it. Uh, masquerading as reporters. Um, they also think that uh, other publications, Al-Qaeda's Inspire magazine, basically, and they could use these to encourage and recruit militants and send them in as reporters. Um, like, I think it's a problem with the massiveness of global war now. Um, and, uh, so... You know, they're going to make the argument, you know, they could be spies, they could be spies, and that's going to make it okay because you've now limited the, the uh, ability of who qualifies as a reporter, who qualifies as the news, who qualifies, and that's the thing, you know. Um, if there was a high-level Berlin newspaper during World War II, 
Uh, what would they have been allowed to cover, you know, in the United States, things like that. So, you know, there's room where it makes some sense, but there's also that, that, that dangerous, you know, uh, consequence of these, uh, changes. Um, so yeah, definitely something to consider because yeah, you don't want spies, um, in there as journalists, but you also don't want to be locking up people that are trying to get the truth out because, you know, obviously we want to know what's going on. Absolutely. So we're going to move forward now here. What are we looking at? Um, move into some national news. I'm going to, I'm going to start. Drone yeah, I'm going to start this one. This was a, I really, honestly, I've been seeing this headline go around since last, I guess this happened yesterday on Sunday. Uh, Bernie Sanders is on this week. Oh, isn't he wonderful? And I think he talked to George <laughs> Stephanopoulos. Yeah, it was this week with George Stephanopoulos and they took a quote from him. And I kind of think that maybe, you know, it, I think it may be reaching in some ways to what he particularly said here because it's not that unreasonable if you're still in their paradigm. You know what I mean? Of like, like Mike was saying, that we're in this constant war and, you know, you can make arguments for why this would make sense, like with, you know, the, the spies and journalists being spies or whatever. Um, but so basically, Bernie Sanders was asked on the interview with George Stephanopoulos whether or not he would end the drone program, if the drone assassination program, uh, if he was elected president. Sanders indicated that he would limit the use of drones so that they do not end up killing innocent people abroad, but declined to say that he would end the targeted killing campaign completely. So of course, right yeah, he says that he will be a benevolent dictator. He will use the missiles for the right reasons. And this is, of course, the same program that um, killed um, alleged accused terrorist uh, Anwar Awalaki and his 16-year-old son, um, who was... Yeah, was also they were both American citizens, and uh, killed them with the same program under the Obama administration. And Bernie says, "I think we have to use drones very, very selectively and effectively. This has not always been the case. What you can argue is there are times and places where drone attacks have been effective." He also says there are times and places where they have been absolutely counter-effective and have caused more problems than they have solved. When you kill us and innocent people, what the end result is that people in the region become anti-American who otherwise would not have been. So, um, you know, a couple of things. I think what he says right off the bat does make sense. Again, if you're coming from this perspective of like, you know, we okay, we're in a war, right? So we're going to maintain war. I guess let's try to find a way that's not sending people into harm's way. And, you know, we'll target our drone strikes as specifically as possible. But obviously we know that, and, you know, with past Freethinker Radio a couple of years ago, we interviewed um, a man who was in Libya. If you guys remember when... Uh, Libya, the bombing campaign over there first started happening whenever they wanted to get rid of Gaddafi and they were launching drone strikes and missile strikes and stuff. And we interviewed a guy who actually worked for the United Nations who lived out there and sent us pictures of, you know, his house collapsed, his dead children, like holding his dead child and just, I mean, really disturbing stuff. And um, so we, we know the bad side of these programs, but Bernie Sanders believes he can use it for uh, the good. And maybe that's a reasonable response because most of America is like, oh, well, we need to have a war, right? This and that. I kind of think that we shouldn't be over there anyways. And But yeah, at the same time, if we're going to have war, then I guess those drones are supposed to be, you know, if we have a cost benefit analysis, you're going to probably save American lives, but then there's going to be these side effect, innocent lives lost on the other side um but i want to get your thoughts on that micah and then also just to throw this out like on the more you know bernie sanders about him himself i'm looking at this other article from mint press news titled bernie sanders's foreign policy includes unlimited military aid to saudi arabia and then you know i found this same article same web or different article same website about saudi arabia having uh, perform more decapitations than ISIS so far this year. And this is, of course, one of the United States' closest allies. So I think that there are some person, some uh, indicators that Bernie Sanders is not really exactly what people think that he is, at least when it comes to the war front and changing, making radical changes when it comes to ending the warfare state. I don't really see that happening. But, I mean, what are your, what are your thoughts on his comments on drones and just in general on the Saudi Arabia? I think you're probably right about Sanders on the not ending the warfare state. You know, um, most of everything he speaks about does tend to be about social programs and uh, changes therein. Um, he's an interesting character, <laughs> to say the least, at least. <laughs> um, and he does have some history, which is something interesting just on Bernie Sanders as a candidate. Um, the drone program. Oh, it's the same problem as always, it's the bravery of being out of range, you know? Well, it's kind of easy to kill people when you don't have to see their faces and kind of, you know, that's that's a little uh, 
um, callous uh, to say, but it's the truth. And it also, um, we, it's something that, you know, needs to be used very carefully. And a lot of times it seems that where you're so, the West, at least for some time now, has been so powerful in weapon technology that they never really have to consider, you know, the blowback of that, the drawback of that, and, you know, these other hurt um, individuals. Earlier you were talking about um, the uh, Geneva Convention with regards to the reporters. If we're not, you know, we're not regarding that with regards to war in the traditional sense in any sort of way we'll just call someone an enemy combatant rather than a soldier because they don't have a country because we decide what countries are or something you know so it's a moral question and it's going to always be a moral question people get all worried about you know a brave new world and technological things uh being the problem when they're just an understanding you know, the a mind was able to understand and make a drone, but then a, another mind comes along and, you know, decides to use it to kill someone. So, you know, no, I don't think he's going to stop the drones. He says he's not. So we, we've got that answer. I feel like in most of the press, people would think he was crazy if he said he was going to stop drones, you know. He would stand out more. So I think it's politically stupid to say that you would stop drones so then what do you do you got to step it up and say that you know you're going to employ the technology the right way because you know once we know how we're not going to forget how i mean we don't plan on it although it's actually true civilizations do forget how to do things um, it'd be nice if we forgot how to make war but i think that's deep after the revolution the hearts and minds but i think what happens you know like you said uh it, in cost benefit analysis, yeah, what's that? A cost benefit analysis, assuming that the uh, um, at the uh, thing is war. You see what I mean? Like rather than a cost benefit analysis of how to live, and this whole thing about giving how umpty ump dollars to uh, Saudi Arabia, how can we ever respect nations and treat them like they're independent? beings and entities in the world if they're like our little brothers and shit like that here's some lunch money you know we're gonna take care of you you know here go fight that guy go fight that guy okay we're gonna replace this guy and you know i think it's kind of sad because i think there's a lot of people that already know this stuff's going on but get caught up in the new they already know that you know we topple regimes here and there and replace them with a dictator elected regimes in south america in the middle east etc yeah um but that that you know, there's this whole class of people that thinks that's just something in the past, or or you know, that's just history. But you know, it's it's like, <laughs> it's a, a possibility still, and it still goes on, and we see it. So, you know, money to Saudi Arabia to what end? You know, and what Saudi Arabia does there? I guess I should care more about who they're executing. But you know, we got people being killed here in jail cells uh, and like on the streets all the time. You know, and I'm not trying to be callous because I've had plenty of friends all over the world they got to live their lives um i'm not so sure giving money to the saudi arabian government's the best thing for the saudi arabian people um so that's that's kind of what i think about it in a nutshell <laughs> i wasn't ready for that <laughs> i guess this teacher wasn't ready to be uh, questioned either i'm gonna go ahead into that story this is kind of lighter side of things you know been in war and police state and, and politics for a moment now um but yeah, let's go on into bureaucracy. We kind of hit that with the gentleman that died in jail earlier and how bloated it was and incapable of dealing with basic human needs of the people it was taking in. Um, there's a teacher, and it's just entertaining. He was 111 times late. Basically, he says he was eating breakfast. He's an elementary school teacher, you know, and I just remember spending time in, in school suspension, which honestly was really probably the best place to be in school if you had to be in school because you could just read but anyway um so this dude's late 111 times in two years 111 times and they're, aren't they off in the summer and don't they get all kinds of holidays <laughs> you get what i mean he's like late like almost every week multiple times right and 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 you know employment it's cool it's not to be preferred i feel sorry for the guy that he's got to be there at a particular time i control my hours myself but you know how it is um he uh so he's got to be there and he wants to eat breakfast so he says quote i have a bad habit of eating breakfast in the morning and i lost track of time he's a 15 year veteran teacher too um and uh it, the, <laughs> yeah he doesn't have a bad habit of waking up early and eating breakfast he just has a bad habit of eating breakfast 
Yeah, now he's like going to be a martyr. He says, you know, I have to cut out eating breakfast at home. Uh, I, he probably gets a free breakfast at the school anyway. But anyway, a, uh, in a decision filed August 19th, an arbitrator in New Jersey rejected an attempt by the Roosevelt in Elementary School in New Brunswick to fire him. Like Basically, he has a $90,000 a year job. $90,000 a year to basically teach elementary school. Uh, <laughs> he was entitled to... He got away with it probably is the deal because they say he was entitled to progressive discipline and like firing right away is like, you know, not progressive because it's instant, you know. But uh, nonetheless, he uh, ended up uh, getting uh, suspended without pay until January 1st. And um, so that's just kind of interesting. Oh, Republican Governor Chris Christie referenced in a case in a tweet. Christie wrote, think I'm too tough on the teachers union. This is what we're dealing with in New Jersey. Um, Anderson said he was very upset to be suspended, but conceded that losing his job would have been worse. Well, at least he listens to reason. I mean, so, and he's got some time, get some breakfast things put together, you know, before he has to go back. And, uh, so be it. I mean, I, I hated school. I mean, I liked learning, but I hated school. In fact, school in a way was one of my first loves, but then it just became this institution, you know, and you know, that's part of what this, this guy's fallen victim to here too, is the, you know, there's the regimen of it. But at the same time, goodness gracious, 111 times I, uh, I'm baffled by it. But uh, the thing that gets me is it's also one of the number one things they drive into you, man, is to be on time, like over and over every day as a kid. That's what you learn. Be on time. Sit in your desk. Put your desk in a row. Look forward and spell imagination. So anyway, more, 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 more. We got more. That's for sure. Thanks for listening to Freethinker Radio. Please share this video. Because um, while we're on the bureaucracies, we can bring up another alphabet soup just kind of absurdity thing because you know it's kind of more lighthearted, even though it's sad too um there's a uh wyoming farmer and he's suing the epa for um uh, he's basically getting the 16 million dollars in fines for building a stock pond and you you may say oh i don't care that that's his land we all affect everybody and that's all cool because you know everybody's entitled to their point of view and yeah we do all affect everybody um so remember that when you talk to people um uh, Farmer Andy Johnson hasn't sent millions of gallons of gold mine wastewater down any rivers, but he's facing more than $16 million in fines from the EPA for running afoul of the Clean Water Act. His violation? In 2012, Mr. Johnson built a stock pond for his horses and cattle on his eight-acre property in Fort Brigger, Wyoming. Even though the Clean Water Act exempts stock ponds, and Mr. Johnson had obtained the necessary state permits, the EPA ordered him in January 2014 to restore the area to its original condition or accumulate fines of 37500 a day. I don't know how much you earn, you know. The guy's got eight acres. That ain't a lot. I know a lot, you know, a lot of people that live sustenance farmers on, you know, 10 acres or less. Instead, Mr. Johnson hired an attorney. Well, you know, that's probably commendable. You know, he's not going to be pushed around. He tried to do everything right. I understand. Okay. Poor guy. The EPA is out to expand its power, and I'm a test case, Mr. Johnson said in a statement. We're going to fight them all the way. Last week, his attorneys, including the Pacific Legal Foundation and Budden Fallon Law Firm in Cheyenne, filed a lawsuit against the EPA to stop it from enforcing the compliance order. The EPA's double standard is mind-blowing, said PLF staff attorney Jonathan Wood in a statement he, after the motion was filed in U.S. District Court. He referred to the torrent of wastewater accidentally released August 5th by the EPA-led team from the Gold King Mine near Silverton. Colorado, which contaminated water supplies along the Animas River in Colorado and New Mexico's San Juan River. That's another one of those things, you know, do as we say, not as we do, one rule for the rulers. Uh, this is the same agency that just created a toxic mess in Colorado's Animas River with no accountability for the blundering bureaucracy, said Mr. Wood. But here they are, threatening Andy Johnson with astronomical fines for building an environmentally beneficial stock pond that actually purifies the water that runs through it. Although stock ponds are specifically excluded from the Clean Water Act, the EPA argued that Mr. Johnson had violated federal law by constructing a dam on Six Mile Creek, which runs through his property in order to fill the stock pond. 
The creek is a tributary of the Green River, which is navigable interstate water of the United States. They own everything. As a result, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers concluded that Mr. Johnson needed a standard project-specific CWA permit and not just the permits issued by Wyoming, which he had obtained. The EPA also described the sand, gravel, clay, and concrete used by Mr. Johnson to construct the dam as dredged material and pollutants. Hmm. Very interesting. So his tab now exceeds $16 million, but EPA spokeswoman Julia B. Valentine told the Casper Star Tribune that the agency has made no final determination regarding financial penalties. Yeah, it's rough. I mean, I understand why people wanted the EPA, but in a lot of ways, it seems like they're busy doing a lot of things that don't have much to do with keeping our uh, water pure. I mean... What do you think about this? I mean, what do you think about using government to, uh, even in the uh, hope that the EPA was able to do its, you know, mission, do you think that's even possible? Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of, there's, a, you know, the, the EPA and a lot of these government agencies were set up to do certain missions. They have certain uh, goals. And in a lot of ways, they... You know, you could argue that they're hindered by other, by competing interests, by lobbyists, people fighting their their efforts and ventures. And I'm sure all of that definitely, you know, it's true and it has a, it says it has truth to that message. But also, I think what you're getting at is 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 true as well, and that they seem to be kind of a hindrance from protecting the communities and to being able to do that. And maybe perhaps if those industry if if that uh you know agency wasn't there we could form our own you know that community could form their own agency they don't come up with their own methods since they know the community best to how to treat it and deal with that and what people they want to let do business in their backyard and things like that and maybe one of the companies has a history for spilling and the epa is okay to, to work with them and give them a permit you know and they grease each other's wheels but they you might every five years yeah yeah so, fine that is like nothing to them their bottom line yeah. you might be like you know what we're not going to take that risk like no, we're not going to work with Andy johnson here poor andy johnson he's got a little little uh farm and uh, this unrealistic thirty seven thousand five hundred dollar a day and i can't even imagine if he's filling a, I, he's got eight acres how big's the stock pond okay that makes me also how big's this little creek he can't have completely dammed the creek because it would totally flood his place you know six mile creek you know okay uh i imagine from what it says that this had brought the initial water and brings it to a certain point to go there. Does he have no rights to Six Mile Creek that goes through his property? I don't know because, you know, everything's divided now. Property rights, mineral rights, water rights. I don't know. I imagine that he probably had surface water rights, but they have deeper laws, and that's part of the problem with all these laws is it's just it's so much legal stuff for the poor guy to jump through. Your average guy who just has some property and is like, okay, I'm going to put some thing here to make it nicer his it's obvious his whole intent is to make it nicer and uh they're up against this and i wonder how many countless little guys are up against this where our world could be nicer by one by one by one by one you know the world is constantly in flux certain things yeah maybe we maybe i would be willing to give some agency some money to make sure that isn't happening but i don't know that this is really any of the result i mean we had the we had the uh, oil spills. We've had numerous oil spills in the light of the EPA, you know. And then we have them releasing stuff. So I don't know. It's like I feel like we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. And uh, I just feel sorry for. It seems like all these little guys that always just get run up in the uh, um, tracks of the tanks that these guys are, you know, because they're huge. How are you going to fight the state, you know? Um, so anyway, also the fact that a bureaucracy can simply fine you in this manner you know he's not found guilty he's not taking a court for it he's fa he's fined this this manner and so he has to counter sue he has to sue these people <laughs> so just to have you know his rights it depends if you think he's got rights to the water that goes over his property yeah, exactly. I guess that gets into a bigger conversation. Maybe we can explore another time about rights and property itself. And also, I want I do want to say that, you know, the idea, the discussion of not having law in a certain area doesn't mean that there wouldn't be organization or, or, you know, order or whatever you want to call it. It just means that it might come in a different form than what we're used to, which is top down, you know, delivery from these uh, these big institutions. 
We're going to shift on to a couple more international stories, and then uh, we're almost at an hour here, so we'll run through these last international stories, do a couple of culture stories, and remind you guys about what we have going on this week that you can get it involved with, and hopefully uh, you're enjoying yourself. You are, of course, listening to Freethinker Radio. This is Derek Bros with Micah Jackson, and we'll be here every Monday night. Um, you know, if you want to follow along with us during the week, follow the houston freethinkers facebook page or the freethinker radio facebook page also if you're interested in checking out new music we we, uh we played uh fetty profound earlier and we're gonna close out with him again and if you want to see new artists like that or you're in the houston area check out visionary noises page and you'll always see lots of stuff happen around the city so this next one i want to get into we mentioned saudi arabia a couple of minutes ago uh in discussion these are the people that bernie sanders wants to continue funding um and really, to be fair, most of the people that are in power will continue this, which is, you know, why I'm, the, the reason I'm harping on him is because he's being sold as like a rebel and somebody different. Uh, we expect this from everyone else. The Saudi-led coalition airstrike kills 36 Yemeni civilians, um, according to the residents, of course. You know, I'm sure if you look at the government report, it probably says like 35 militants were, you know, annihilated and we raised the flag. And um, airstrike led by warplanes from a Saudi-led coalition, which said it was targeting a bomb-making factory, killed 36 civilians working at a bottling plant in the northern Yemeni province of Haija on Sunday, residents said. In another air raid on the capital of capital Sana'a, residents said four civilians were killed when a bomb hit their house near a military base in the south of their city. The attacks were the latest in an air campaign launched in March by an alliance made up of mainly Gulf Arab states in support of the exiled government in its fight against who forces allied to iran that's at least you know i do want to say this like i, I okay i don't want to go too far into it because i'm not the most versed in it but i've done a little bit of reading about the houthi and like in general when the west is talking about iran it's generally propaganda and this whole thing that's being sold as you know our allies saudi arabia fighting you know isis or these terrorist groups um there is some arguments being made that this is really just an saudi arabian attack on yemen itself um and they have a history back and forth the process of recovering the bodies is finished now the corpses of 36 workers many of them burnt or in pieces were pulled out after an airstrike at the plant this morning said one of the residents to reuters by phone the coalition spokesman brigadier general ahmed asiri denied the strike had hit a civilian target saying it was a location used by the houthis to make improvised explosive devices and to train african migrants whom they had forced to take up arms we got very accurate information about the position and attacked it. it is not a bottling factory he said he accused the houthis of using african uh, migrants stuck in yemen after arriving by sea before the war and the hope crossing the saudi border and finding the work in oil produce and in the oil production company as cannon fodder and dangerous border operations human rights group amnesty international said in a report this month that the coalition bombing campaign had left quote a bloody trail of civilian death which would amount which could amount to war crimes and i really think that most of the nations any of them are at power in these campaigns are probably all responsible for human rights violations and that just depends on which viewpoint you take if you're looking at it from the government control then they're fighting terrorists but if uh you know, if the terrorists ever win and succeed in their war or whatever it may be, then we'll, you know, we'll see those roles switch. That's the interesting thing about history. You got to question everything. Um, another one I got here, and I love these type of stories. This is something I would put in the solutions, positive side of thing, um, whether or not we agree with every one of these protesters, but just the fact that people are making shows of, um, you know, awareness. Shit, in America, it's hard to get people to, to really rally together. Um, you know, I, I've been reading a lot of old revolutionary history from like the anarchists the communists and the socialists and seeing like where they went wrong where i might agree where i disagree and um, there's some interesting things you know one of the interesting concepts that i've came across is just the idea that you know like third world revolution that basically the idea that um the first world america the west has become too comfortable and that you're not going to be able to encourage a revolution in this nation whether it's a philosophical you know mental revolution or a revolution out on the streets because we're too fat and happy we're too industrialized you know we're too comfortable so americans won't be roused to that and that so you know some some people who made those arguments said that's why you must look to the third world, you know, look to the peasantry and to the working class because those are the people that will rise up. And I, and I, th I just think that that's true in some some regards. You look at other countries that are rioting, or you know, not to say that that's the answer necessarily, but they're frustrated and they're frustrated at levels that are way below what we're already dealing with. You know, um, did you want to add something? To that? Well, I was going to say that there's other uh, Western states where people are more active than they are in the United States. In in France, it's a good example. I mean. Not that the U.S. is much like France, but we're Western powers, and they, uh, 
you know, the students take to the streets all the time. Anything's changed with school. Um, and, and not just, you know, we're lucky to get a couple thousand out to anything, you know. A few thousand is a big event. Um, but, you know, they'll be out in tens and hundreds of thousands, uh, you know, in the main streets of multiple cities. So I think that some people recognize how important, like, it, the voice still is. And I, I, I see it occasionally happening in the United States. And I'd like to believe that, you know, podcasts, Facebook, these things do help people to find uh, their group of people to work with and go out and talk to people with. So I think that, yeah, I think that a lot of times I'll say they're not going to storm the Bastille until they're starving. But at the same time, um, maybe we don't have to get to starving even. Yeah, exactly. So this one is coming from Japan. We've got uh, some of the organizers of the protest said 120,000 people, uh, but tens of thousands for sure gathered near Japan's parliament building on Sunday to oppose legislation allowing the military to fight overseas. This is the latest sign of public mistrust in, against Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, his security policy, and I guess they've got a new bill, security bill, coming through. Demonstrators swarmed into the street before parliament's main gate after the crowd size made it impossible for police out in heavy numbers to keep them to the sidewalks. A second nearby park area also was filled with protesters, and this rally was one of more than 300 happening around the country in Japan, protesting Abe's move to loosen the post-war pacifist constitution constraints on the military. Um, one protester, an associate, a 44-year-old associate pro uh, professor, uh, and it uh, doesn't say he's at French, doesn't say which university, but this guy said, sitting in front of TV and just complaining wouldn't do. If I don't take action and try to put a stop to this, I will not be able to explain to my, myself, to my children in the future, um, said Hiramatsu. He was holding a four-year-old son in his arms, or sorry, in her arms, in the thick of the protest. All, uh, in July, the Prime Minister pushed through Parliament's lower house a group of bills that lets Japan's armed forces defend an ally under attack, a drastic shift in Japan's <coughs> post-war security policy, which I'm imagining, I guess, after they've had a pretty anti-interventionist policy, it seems like they're saying. The bills are now before the upper chamber, which is also controlled by the Prime Minister's ruling bloc and aims to pass the legislation before Parliament ends its session on September 27th. The Prime Minister's ratings have taken a hit from opposition due to these security bills. Uh, media surveys show those who oppose his government outnumber backers and more than half are against the security bills. Uh, we've got another, the, the, the head of the Japan's largest opposition party, the Democratic Party of Japan, says we need to make the Abe government realize the public is having a sense of crisis and angry. Let, and is angry, let's work together to have these bills scrapped. The demonstration was the biggest in Tokyo since the mass protest against nuclear power in the summer of 2012 following the Fukushima disaster, which was massive as well. So, yeah, probably... A, at least a hundred thousand people or so all across the country that's that's pretty it's pretty awesome you know and i do th want to say that the past couple of years i saw some big people i like, get rallied after like the no war against syria that was kind of a big ones happening around the country and making news but also like things like march against monsanto and stuff have taken off and um but you know for me even the big protests even if we do come out with like a hundred thousand people in the street if everybody just go home goes home after that then to me it's kind of like all right well that felt good for us but did we make the change that we were going after you know and it's about what you do with that energy and what you turn it into and uh and where it goes to you know following that and i think that's probably the most important step well you know um that person said they that professor said they couldn't live in themselves that they didn't type thing or they couldn't uh they wouldn't feel right telling their children they set, set by while it happened i think things like that happen and then people have to take action and then they go out and then they're affected by what happens when they go out because you know i've gone to protest and to rally for things you know um but I don't find myself acting in that manner as much. We went out, we met people, you know, we talked to people, we expanded the idea, we just discovered we're not alone, find other politicians, find other ways to do things and start working in that manner. Um, but I, I uh, you know, I don't, the protest itself is not the result. You know, the protest is, you know, kind of, a reaction to what's happening and uh, that's why I think you know even with HFT we used to have protests but we were quickly turned them into rallies you know and we were soon no longer complaining about this or that but talking to people about things they could do you know if they had a problem with the Federal Reserve or if they had a problem with the police state but at the same time nowadays you know you read these things and it's still you know it's still out there so we're just 
hope that people are building networks of people that are working to um, do something about this because that's what we've been doing and uh, you know finding ways to not sponsor it in our own personal lives because it's not just finding people to work with I think a big part of it is like figuring out how to run your life you know in consistency with your principles and with like who you are um, and I and I think all that is tied into activism and being active, you know, and not passive in life, you know, just picking one or two candidates or something. That's really a passive view, you know. Um, and so anyway, so did you have more you wanted to say about that? Uh, no. Okay, definitely. We're running, we're running long today. Yeah, definitely um, uh, moving on to Venezuela because... You know, I, I was kind of wanted the Japan thing was interesting, too, because, you know, after World War II, they didn't really have a military. And they're all, the only reason they're not listed in the nations without um, a military right now is they have a force that they send with the U.N. places. And it's kind of the same thing as what you're saying. You know, these little changes, they have to be made to change, you know. So um, if that's something that culture wanted to do, then they'd have to, you know, amend their constitution. Of course, just like many constitutions this constitution came you know at the barrel of a gun more or less at the end of a war and you know things aren't always the same in those moments yeah you know we talk a lot about the federal reserve we talk a lot about fiat currency and we talk about alternative currency get people to think about what money really is rather than just accept what they've been told it is and figure out then how to use that force in their lives um people in venezuela Man, I tell you, South America, maybe because of all the manipulation that goes on down there with uh, regimes and such, I have no idea. But um, uh, they're saying that Venezuela is starting to have more inflation because uh, the headline basically, printing, and this is from Bloomberg, printing money goes high, haywire in Venezuela. And uh, this just came out on the 28th. Venezuela seems to be hovering on the edge of tipping into hyperinflation, or perhaps it has already fallen into the abyss. Given the paucity of official data, the none too believable official figures were published in February. It's hard to tell. The best guess we have at the value of the Venezuelan Bolivar comes from the Colombian village of Cucuta. I hope I said, yeah, I said that right. What am I talking about? <laughs> where, where people go to buy currency so that they can smuggle subsidized fuel and other price controlled goods out of Venezuela. You know, you, we usually see those things going together, price control and inflation, hyperinflation. Um, as The Economist notes, transactions are few. The dollar rate is calculated indirectly from the value of the Colombian peso. The result is erratic, but more realistic than the official rates, than the three official rates. <laughs> Using those rates, economist Steve Henke told Bloomberg that the annual cost of living increases are running at about 722%. To put that in perspective, it means that a $400 a month grocery bill would climb to 2888 a year. That may not approach the legendary status of Hungary's post-war inflation, which reached 41.9 quadrillion percent in a single month. But it's devastating to savers or for people like pensioners whose incomes consist of payments. It's also pretty bad for the economy. It's a bit of a mystery why this is happening. No, right, don't tell me. The government is printing too much money. Indeed, as Milton Friedman famously said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. When too much money is cashing too few chasing too few goods, prices rise. And the most common source of too much money is government printing presses. But I'm not asking for the mechanism. I'm asking for the reason. Why is the Venezuelan government resorting to the printing press? I know you've got an answer to that, too. That's the uh, sangre. That's the fancy name for the profit a government m makes by printing bills and minting coins. Hmm. Senorage. Yeah, senorage. I just say it weird. Um, and uh, so the government makes a little money every time they, you know, make money. <laughs> if you can buy more goods and services with the cash you made than it costs for you to make it, you essentially collect a stealthy sort of tax on the people who take the money from you and give you valuable stuff in exchange. In general, seniorage revenue is trivial. Indeed, it costs the U.S. government more to make nickels and pennies than the coins themselves are worth. But even the higher value bills, the revenues pale in comparison, say, to the income tax. 
Estimates are hard to come by, but a 1992 analysis of the Federal Reserve put the value of seniorage to the Treasury at about 1.6% of the real federal on budget expenditure. It's not nothing, but it's not going to keep civil servants in pensions either. And the U.S. enjoys an annual amount of seniorage revenue because dollars are in heavy demand among citizens of unstable countries and people who want to conduct illegal transactions in cash. Governments can try to jack up amount of seniorage revenue by stealth stealthily inflating the currency. Basically, they exploit an information as asymmetry between them and the people. They trade the money too. The government knows how much money there is, and the citizens don't. So, they'll probably accept fewer units of currency than they would if they knew the government was going to print extra money and thus cause prices to rise again. But this is a terrible way to make money, which is why governments normally don't resort to this one clever trick for raising money without spending without raising taxes. The problem is that inflation expectations rise pretty rapidly to compensate, and then the government needs to print even more money to outrace its no newly suspicious trading partners. The co core thing to understand about inflation as a policy tool is that, in general, steady-state inflation doesn't do you any good. What you need is accelerating inflation. A little bit of inflation is actually okay. It allows the economy to naturally cushion economic shocks that would otherwise lead to unemployment. In the dark ages of economics, some people got, got the idea that if a little bit of inflation was good, more must be better. Set the print and presses to full stun and enjoy perpetually higher economic growth. You still see this folk economics circulating on the internet from time to time, but this doesn't work. People start to expect the inflation, and the economy run returns to the natural level of output, except that everyone's savings are now worth less, until they're worth less. <laughs> to get more growth, you have to inflate even faster than you did before. Inflation, unfortunately, once inflation starts accelerating, it's kind of hard to stop, because people also start pricing the acceleration into their expectations. Hyperinflation has all sorts of bad knock-on effects. It hurts your capital base. It makes people unwilling to plan for the future because they have no idea what their money will even be worth. But the supreme irony is after a certain point, the government starts losing money. You probably heard of the much maligned Laffer Curve, which was used to support unrealistically optimistic estimates of the revenue-generating effects of the Reagan-era tax cuts. But it actually does a pretty good job of describing what happens to the government revenues during hyperinflation. First they go up, but then they go down, 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 and the government stops being able to buy goods and services because people don't have any use for money, except maybe to econo economize on the Kleenex they no longer can afford to buy. These are no arcane secrets known only to a select few in the economics community. I guarantee there are sober analysts in the Venezuelan government who know exactly where this is headed. Why then? They have let things get to a point where they are preparing to issue even bigger bills so that people don't have to carry around a sack of money every time they want to go for a quart of milk. Part of the answer is that in the early days, inflation does make the government a little more money. And the point is at which it starts to lose money is also the point at which the freight train is traveling 120 miles an hour and has a choice between slamming on the brakes and killing everyone instantly or waiting to hurtle off the cliff. Embezzlers and counting frauds often start this way. They fudge things just a little to cover a temporary shortfall, only the underlying problem doesn't go away, and they need to fudge even more the next quarter to cover up both the gap they have now and the gap they covered up last quarter. They tend to be uncovered when the gap is so big that it can no longer be fudged. This is what happened to Bernie Madoff when the market collapsed. Yep, lots of information there. We're going to have all these links put up in the, uh, in the show info on the YouTube, and I think that we'll probably just do that we did one episode on soundcloud but we'll probably just go ahead and switch it over to youtube because i said we got a time limit there on that and uh unless there's anything really imperative you want to mention we're at 115 you want to go ahead and wrap it up uh, mention i want to remind you again uh we have this thursday night the houston freethinkers meeting at midtown bar and grill 12 uh not 1215 715 west gray uh just look up midtown bar and grill in houston texas and we'll be up there the meeting usually starts actually about 7 30 we start gathering about 7 and the next day, following day, there will be a 
screening of the documentary Cowspiracy, which looks at the farming industry, uh, fishing industry, a lot of those different industries. And it's also going to be a vegan potluck as well. Whether you're vegan or not, just come out and check out the documentary. Maybe you'll see some foods you didn't even realize were vegan that you might like. And that's Friday night. And then the next day, Saturday morning, 9 a.m. to 12 or so, we're going to be having a garden day and picnic at the Last Organic Outpost. And they're also going to be selling pizza there. So, yeah, it's time to plant for fall. It's the beginning of September. I don't know what your weather likes where you're at in Houston, but here in Houston, it's still a bit hot, but now's the time to plant for the coming months. And we can plant all kinds of greens and squash and lots of crops that we can grow out here in Houston because of our somewhat tropical climate. And there's uh, just good things happening. I know Mike has got a couple events he knows about happening this weekend, but, yeah, those are the things that the Houston Freethinkers will be involved in, so look out for that. Yeah, we're running long. So I mentioned some things earlier. I'm going to mention this event. It is even in Houston. It's it's still hot because it's hot in Houston. But um, we've had a couple of nights where it was in the 80s and the days where it's just in the low 90s. So it is starting to cool down. It's a good time to start getting back outside if you've been hiding from the sun. Anyway, but nonetheless, uh, so um, we got the HFT meeting Thursday. If y'all can make it out, that's wonderful. Bring a friend. Um, also, Saturday at the Midtown Bar and Grill, um, there's an uh, acoustic show. This is going to be kind of a different vibe. It's going to be a lot of fun. Christina uh, from Metanoia. Some of you might know her from The Super or from Metanoia. <laughs> um, um, Zach Naver, Luvia Dreams. Uh, they played uh, some of our shows before festivals. Uh, Grand Antler Teeth, and that's Chad and um, John from Cosmic Bug Loaf. And a uh, band that I haven't worked with before that we're really excited to have there when we were thieves. So, uh, um, you know, if you're looking for something to do, that should be a pretty mellow yet uh, good show. A lot of acoustic music, uh, acoustic drums. Just going to be a nice night there at Midtown Bar and Grill. And I know we got that. Um, they're having a uh, the um, um, Houston Radical Book Club. Check that out if that's something you're interested in. They're reading the new uh, Libertarian Manifesto at present. But who knows what the next book could be? You know, you could help influence that. So that might be something to get into. And if you're already into it, you know... Uh, you know where to meet up with that. Just a quick reminder. So this is uh, Freethinker Radio. Thank you for tuning in. Like, share our stuff if you do. And if you got anything you'd like to uh, send us, uh, send it to the Freethinker Radio uh, Facebook page, and we'll be sure to get to it. And uh, for more music, please check out our uh, friends at Visionary Noise. They're always building great shows and cultural events in the Houston and, I guess, beyond. So thanks again. Thank you guys for listening. We'll be back next Monday with, uh, I guess that's going to be the 9-11 episode. So maybe we'll talk a bit about some of the latest information on that and just everything else going on in the world. We try to cover what's happening in Houston and, you know, important things. So if you ever have uh, ideas or topics, like Micah said, contact us through the Freethinker radio page. Thank you guys for listening. As always, if you can hear this, you are the resistance. Live free, think free, and you will be free. Lord, please, can you just tell me what I need? What I need? Can you just tell me what I need? What I need? What I need? Uh. And what I need is to stop pretending everything's alright I need to start sleeping and stop staying up all night I need to stop drinking, I'm an angry alcoholic I need to flush these pills and go back to smoking chronic Need to tell my wife I love her, tell my daughter that I love her more Every day before I leave and step out my front door They're the only ones there for my emotional support And only ones on my side every time I'm in court I need to stay out of jail so I can provide for my seat I need another 20 G's just to pay these attorney fees I need to stop spending money on recording equipment If I ain't gonna promote my album every time that it's finished I need to sit down with my wife and talk to her for a minute And see how she's been living ever since I've been slipping Yesterday I sat her down, at first she was resistant Then she started asking me questions about my condition She said Lord please, can you just tell me what I need? What I need? Can you just tell me what I need? What I need? Uh. I need to stop 
spending so much time in front of my computer I need to start dealing with my problems a lot sooner I need to stop sleeping with my Glock and tripping off intruders I need to shrug things off and get a sense of humor I need to find my religion before I end up in prison I need to focus on my vision before I start making decisions I need to start respecting other people's opinions I need to stop fighting with so many people and burning bridges I need to find some time relaxing, hang out with my family I need to stop tripping off how I'm living financially I need to focus on this moment, try and find my sanity My mom keeps telling me I need to cut back on profanity I really need to start learning to have some patience I need to visit my mother on a more regular basis Tomorrow I'ma see her no matter how tired my ass be I know she gon' sit me down and she gon' ask me Tell me what I need, what I need. Lord, please, can you just tell me what I need?